Good morning, District 287 staff. I'm Regina Neville, Chair of the 287 School Board. On behalf of the board, I welcome you to the 2020-2021 school year, a year that will be different in every way imaginable. First, I want to thank you for your resilience, creativity, and effort as we navigate educating our students during the pandemic. I stand with all of you who have lost loved ones in these recent months. I particularly want to acknowledge the stresses of our staff, especially those who care for their own children while working from home, and many who support their own students with distance learning. It's okay not to be okay. We cannot underestimate the importance of taking care of ourselves. It's impossible to fill other people from an empty vessel. Your well-being comes first. Please take care of yourselves and know that you are brilliant, you are valued, you are appreciated, you are awesome. We begin this school year with the reality that we continue to struggle with the injustice of systemic racism. Silence is not an acceptable option. It's necessary to show up. I take on my own responsibility as a white woman to see what I had the privilege of not seeing growing up and taking action. One step is my participation in a year-long equity cohort to address school inequality to better inform my role as a school board member. I intend to take many more action steps. Moments like now are why teaching is critical and why the work you do is so important. Educators have some of the hardest yet most important jobs in our society. There's a new appreciation and awareness for our teachers from parents, policymakers, and others. I saw a poll recently of parents from across the country. It found that 80% have newfound respect for teachers and 69% believe being a teacher is harder than their current job. This, is, this acknowledges what we already know to be true. On behalf of the school board, I again want to thank you and let you know how appreciated you are. We are honored to serve as your board members. We are incredibly proud of you and of our system. Let's make it a great year. Good morning to seven colleagues. I'm so excited to be your MC this morning as we kick off the 2021 school year. I'm Ray's guest and I'm incredibly proud to have joined the 287 team this summer as the Director of Equity and Inclusion. I'm impressed with the work 287 has done and look forward to pushing full steam ahead on our race equity journey. Three things before we get the program started. First, thank you in advance for being patient and flexible with any technical challenges that may have happened during the program. Consider these moments of time to take a stretch break or grab a cup of coffee or tea or water. Second, I want to encourage staff to stay engaged this morning. We have the comments open on YouTube and we're using the hashtags pound 287 chat and pound 287 talk about race on Twitter. Make a quick post if something strikes you. And at the end of the program, you have to submit your exit ticket, which is located in the 287 website and was also sent to you via email. Third, I want to introduce you to a term that you will hear throughout today's program and this school year. It's BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C. It stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. It's a term that represents both the distinctiveness and inclusion of people of varying shades. I also want to thank Board Chair Neville for her thoughtful welcome to our staff. 
she hit a nail on the head, this will be a year like no other, but a year full of opportunity. For example, now more than ever, we have an opportunity to listen to our students and their families, to understand their experiences, to understand what works and doesn't work in the new school reality, to understand our students' educational and psychological health, and to understand how the events of this spring and summer, including the murder of George Floyd and COVID-19, affected them. With that being said, we have an opportunity right now to listen to the poetry of an incredibly talented young Black poet. You've heard Lonnie's poetry in, before, and he certainly created a following. Lonnie has published three chapbooks. His chapbooks have been presented by award-winning poets at places like Bloom Palace, have been brought in college curriculum by poets at Osborne College, the New School in New York, and Carleton College. As you listen to Lonnie's poem, imagine yourself sitting in a classroom. This young poet is your teacher, and you are their student. Not a student in elementary, middle, or high school. You are a student of life. What our students teach us is incredible knowledge that helps us grow as educators and as humans. I will now read Ode to Every Black Boy. Boy in the living and the dead, but especially the living. Ode to the ones going to college and playing football and being who they are and not letting people get to them, even the racists. Ode to the black boys who don't stop and who stay proud. Ode to the black boys who see other black boys getting shot and getting abandoned. Ode to the black boys in foster care who survive everything. Ode to the black boys who get really angry and think no one cares and find someone to support them. Ode to the black boys who tell their own stories. Ode to the black boys who can still do it, who are smart and artistic. Ode to the black boys who are artists. I see them. I am proud of us. And we're all gonna find somebody to love us. On behalf of all of us, I thank Lonnie for speaking his truth, being vulnerable and teaching us about life. Now we're going to switch gears and hear from our courageous leader, Superintendent Lewandowski. In just a couple of months of knowing Sandy, I found to see how bold she is as a leader committed to racial justice. I've come to know how empathetic and understanding she is of others' hardships. And I've also come to see how relentless she is when it comes to our district priorities, especially race equity and our trauma-centered and healing-centered work. Coming to you live from her office, here's Superintendent Lewandowski. I've come to know how empathetic and understanding she is of others' hardships. 
And I've also come to see how relentless she is when it comes to our district priorities, especially race equity and our trauma-centered and healing-centered work. Coming to you live. Again, I asked you to kind of work, deal with us, support us with the technical difficulties. <laughs> in this one. Superintendent, we cannot hear you. There we go. Again, I asked you to kind of work, deal with us, support us with the technical difficulties in this one. Superintendent, we cannot hear you. Radius, can you be sure to uh, mute your mic? Yes, and anybody else that's not um, that's not speaking, please mute your mic. So we don't have that. Radius, can you be sure to uh, mute your mic? And anybody else that's not um, that's not speaking, please mute your mic. So we don't. Now go back. Let me know when she decides. Okay, try again. Well, good morning, 287 colleagues. I certainly never thought I'd be coming to you virtually from my office, not even in my wildest dreams. But here we are. And what a challenge we find before us. Are we up to it? There is no doubt in my mind. I only say that because I know from past experiences of the integrity and passion already embodied, embodied in the collective spirit of 287. We just need to find the correct set of keys to unlock the right path for these challenging times. First, I want to acknowledge that the land we are on from our homes or schools is of the Dakota and Ojibwe nations, the original guardians of the country we now call America. Let us acknowledge the pain of these indigenous people whose lands, lives, culture, and languages were stolen, taken, or destroyed. Secondly, I'd like to take a moment of silence to honor George Floyd, our fellow Minnesotan whose life ended because of yet another incident of deadly violence against Black lives. George Mur Floyd's murder started a worldwide revolution that will raise our individual and collective consciousness around race equity. It is not so hard to imagine that any one of our staff or students might find themselves in such a situation. And that is why we are doing this work. If you are so inclined, please take a moment of silence or a knee as a symbol of solidarity with those fighting for racial justice. Around race equity, it is not so hard to imagine that any one of our staff or students might find themselves in such a situation. And that is why we are doing this. I wholeheartedly welcome you back with great excitement. At the same time, I'm speaking to you today with some powerful emotions of sadness and worries. The worries are almost like a test question with several multiple choice answers, all of which would be correct. Do I worry about COVID-19? the division that pervades our country, 
the pain and racial trauma and injustice that BIPOC people experience their entire lives. Hurricanes, fires, floods. Yes, I worry about all of those things. But the concern taking center stage is the one right before my eyes, the students and staff at District 287. Perhaps the most important of those concerns is for our staff. For if our staff is healthy, cared for, and supported in the best way possible to do their jobs, I know the students will be cared for as well. Let's take a talk about that for just a moment, for an intimate moment. How are each of you doing? I mean, how are you really doing? Are you alone at home, surrounded by family, have someone to talk to? If not, is there someone you could approach? Who, if you find yourself saying, I'll get through this, I'm tough, or I'll just fail until I make it, that may be a sign that your well being is coming second, third, or more likely 10th in your life. As well, it is just as important to have that support system in the workplace. Were your colleagues checked in on you yet? And have they reached out to others to see how they're doing? Fostering that climate of actively and deliberately supporting each other is invaluable for all of our well being. As we come together at the beginning of this school year in these unprecedented times, let's all make a pact to make the well-being of our 287 family as top-notch as it may be by looking after each other. I watched a video clip last week of a teacher on TikTok talking about an exchange with her school principal. She was in tears. Her principal had provided constructive feedback, which she fully welcomed, yet there was nothing positive about all the hard work she had done. Like this teacher, many of us will have moments when we feel we're at a breaking point. We have to be a workplace that affirms the good work of our colleagues. Also, like this teacher in the video, you may need to cry it out. I know I have this summer. Crying is not weak. It's not for people who are sensitive or emotional. If you think strong people don't cry, let me give you a reason to think about this differently. Emotional tears have extraordinary health benefits. For example, crying releases stress hormones and toxins. It activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps your body rest. It releases feel-good chemicals that can help ease both physical and emotional pain. And sobbing, in particular, regulates the temperature of your brain which can lift your spirits. Your body is smart. Crying since the time you were a baby lets others know you need support. Let's also remember there will be times when our students feel they are at their breaking point and times when parents and caregivers are at their breaking points. We need to affirm and support them just as we need to affirm and support each other. I have a new challenge for us. It's a 287 challenge. I challenge you to reach out to three of your colleagues to simply check in and see how they're doing. Then challenge each of them to reach out to three other colleagues. This family tree will have deep roots and grow strong and tall and will make sure all of our branches stay firmly connected and supported. We need to affirm and support each other. No doubt, this year will be different. It will be very different. We are dealing with two pandemics, COVID-19 and racism, and we must address both. It's a year where the intersection of race, trauma, and this pandemic will collide. Many are rightfully anxious and worried or scared. Many are uncertain about the times before us and the untold suffering from the times behind us. But I'd like to propose that this uncertainty isn't always bad. Perhaps we need a way to shift our mindsets about the year ahead. For decades, educational leaders, leaders have worked to reform America's public education system, but the system is not broken. 
It's working exactly the way it was designed to work. White students do relatively well, while their black and brown peers fail over and over. This well-designed system spell, spills over into the new realities consuming us this year as COVID-19 rages on, as evidenced by the disproportionate number of BIPOC people, of BIPOC deaths and rates of infection compared to white people. But we have a ch chance to change this system. It all boils down to what we do in our little corner of the world, in our little corner of the city, in District 287. Imagine the future with me for a moment. It's 2030. Grubhub, Uber Eats no longer deliver food. Drones deliver them. The President of the United States, a woman of color, fully funds public education. Teachers are making six figures because it's finally ranked the most valued profession. And hundreds of schools across the country are renamed George Floyd Elementary School or Jamar Clark Middle School or Philando Castile High School to remind us how people of color are treated in our society is often a matter of life and death. When we finally realize what really matters, the students who attend these future schools will thrive. And what a great day that will be. What we do now can make that happen. But back to reality, it's 2020, and we can create a different future for our students. This new reality is an opportunity to flip education on its head and do ways, things in a way that we've never imagined before. It's an opportunity to disrupt racist policies and systems. It's an opportunity to use our resources different, to be innovative in ways we can and ensure that our students' academic, mental, and social emotional health needs are met. This will require more than thinking out of the box. We will need to drastically change the box or get rid of it altogether. What would the new box or new parameters look like? Well, it, it could be action civics, teaching students how to take action on an issue that affects them and their communities, or holding small meetings in unusual places like museums and parks and businesses or community centers. Yes, exciting and wild is good. But then again, maybe everything also just gets a little slower and gentler and more aware. There's room for all kinds of new energies in this new paradigm. But before we look forward, we have to take an in-depth look at our past and the context in which our students are entering this school year. COVID-19 has shaken the world for our families and also staff. This means some will come to school or work with more persistent and severe mental health conditions. Some families have lost their homes. Many have lost their jobs. Some need to work three jobs to make ends meet. Some lost a grandmother, auntie, or brother to COVID-19. And many will have watched the eight minute and 46 second video of a white officer pressing his knee against the neck of George Floyd as he said, I can't breathe. Some were participants in the series of demonstrations that took place on our street. Some experienced being pepper sprayed, tear gassed, maced, or seeing police officers in riot gear and watching pain on a level many of us will never experience or understand. The deep wounds of racial trauma are wide open. Let's say their names. Trevon Martin, 17, he was walking home after getting Skittles at 9-11. Tamir Rice, 12, he was playing with a toy gun in a park. Shani Proctor, 18, she needed medical care while in police custody, but it was refused. Tyree King, 13, he was holding an air gun. Michael Brown, 18, he was walking with his friend. Ayanna Stanley Jones, seven. She was sleeping on her couch when a SWAT team threw a grenade in her family's apartment, burst into the house, 
and she was shot in the head. They had the wrong apartment. And Emmett Till, 14, he was alleged to have whistled at a white woman. They were children, black girls and black boys, and any one of them could have been one of our students. Let's let that sink in. Because one of my deepest fears as a superintendent is that I'll wake up to a phone call that we have lost one of our black students in a police shooting. As a white woman with two white sons, I cannot imagine the fears that our black parents have when they listen to the news these days. The fears that our black and brown staff have for their own lives and their children's. And the fears that our black and brown students as they walk through our schools and communities, knowing their skin color will predict so many aspects of their lives. Because we need our black students to know Black lives matter, their lives matter, their dreams matter, their experience in 287 matters. All lives can't matter until Black lives matter. And I want our Black staff to know your life matters. Your fears and your dreams matter. Your experiences in 287 and our communities matter. I want our white staff to know Saying Black Lives Matter is not enough. Being a white ally and being in solidarity with BIPOC communities is not enough. Protesting signs, t-shirts, and Instagram posts are not enough. Treating everyone with respect and dignity, regardless of race, is not enough. We need you to do what we have not been able to do in the past, Let's liberate our children through you. I say this because our failures have never been about the children, but rather about us as adults. Do we have a long way to go? Yes. Will it be hard? Yes. Can we celebrate our growth and progress with those who have been impacted by our work? Yes. I saw a list recently about action steps we've taken in this district in the past few years. To name a few, a dozen racial equity teams were formed. We use racial equity lens tools for planning and decision making, and our school board passed a racial equity policy that protects BIPOC people. We've created race, racial affinity spaces, we've developed the therapeutic teaching program, and the school safety coaches are a model that now is known across the country. We have a tiered classroom model that equitably administers resources and is not racially predictable. And our curriculum and instruction team has developed culturally relevant units and courses, a rubric for reviewing cultural relevance of curriculum and instruction, and a more culturally relevant literacy curriculum is now across all K-8 sites. There's a Chinese proverb that says, it is better to take many small steps in the right direction than to make a giant leap forward only to stumble backwards. To my white colleagues, I want to say, we have difficult and essential work before us to become anti-racist, new things to learn, and poor, most importantly, things we must unlearn. I invite you to ask yourself the question I have asked myself this summer, what silence or inaction am I responsible for that is re perpetuating inequities? Part of this unlearning will require us to listen radically, believe what we hear, recognize other sides of the narrative, acknowledge wrongdoing, and disrupt the systems that led us to this point in the first place. You may have heard the Zimbabwean proverb before, until the lion tells his side of the story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. The stories we hear on the news, the books we read in our classrooms, the racial perspectives of American history 
are we seeking out the narratives that tell a different side of the story, the counter narrative, the story that has never been told, or the story you knowingly or unknowingly silence or refuse to hear. At the end of our last school year, our EAP provider, Sand Creek, held sessions with the BIPOC staff to better understand the experiences of people who work in our district. Those sessions provided white staff a counter narrative to what we white people in this district might believe. And this is what I've learned. Some BIPOC staff, there's a lot of talk about what the district would like to change, but there is lack of action after some BIPOC staff feel it's extremely difficult to advance up the ranks in District 287 while their white peers can do so easily. Some feel the ideas, attitude, and presence of black people and other people of of color are not wanted in leadership. Some feel that white staff do not understand cultures outside of their own. There were comments about our BIPOC staff wanting white staff to use their voices to call out their white counterparts on stereotyping, judgments, and racist behavior. Some of these examples included microaggressions such as, such as comments on hair, comments on smells, or failed humor attempts. Some BIPOC staff feel they, there are inconsistent responses to conflicts, whether the employee is a person of color or white, and that their concerns are not heard by leadership. Some staff feel they are often labeled or are targets of retaliation once they raise a concern. The most difficult to hear was this. Some BIPOC staff in our school district feel devalued as a person and as a human being. The sentiment from the staff who participated in these sessions are valid. I believe that these are your experiences and I'm sorry we haven't done better. I hope that over the course of this school year, both I and my white colleagues can begin to address this feedback. The accountability starts with me and the leaders in this organization. My promise to you is this, I will interrogate my whiteness and my anti-blackness. I will have bold and courageous conversations with the leaders of our school and with the district. I will be curious and open and I will reflect on my own fragility and defensiveness and I will create a culture where talking about race and confronting systems of whiteness is the norm. And finally, I promise that what I expect of myself, I also expect of the leaders of this organization, and I challenge you to do the same. Race equity is a tool for systems change. All of our policies, procedures, programs, curriculum, hiring, recruiting, and retaining, how we spend our money and who we do our business with and so much more will be examined using a race equity lens. We will use accountability tools like moving racial consciousness into action tool and the equity impact analysis tool to hold ourselves individually and collectively accountable. I give you permission right now, today, to approach me, email me, or call me if I say or do something that doesn't reflect these promises. I won't be perfect in this work. It's not if I will mess up, but when. This work is about impact, not intent. Impact on our students, our families, and our staff. And I want you to know I will hold myself accountable. But I will also need you to hold me responsible. If the perpetuating of the inequities is due in some small or large part to my silence or action, then you must tell me, and I promise to listen and to act. In the past several years during this back to school stage, I have shared some of my beliefs. This summer has only deepened the passion with which I share but act on these beliefs. What we have all been through this summer, COVID-19, 
the pain and rage and heartache of racial injustice has brought things to a head, brought the realities of what we are dealing with into sharper focus. I believe that Black lives matter. All lives can't matter until Black lives matter. I believe that we must bring awareness to the often invisible names and stories of Black women and girls who've been victimized by racist police violence. Hashtag, say her name, Brianna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Miriam Carey, Michelle Casso, Rikia Boyd, and Kayla Moore, and Kayim Livingston, and so many others. I believe they deserve justice. I believe that police officers have no place in our District 287 schools and replacing them with student safety coaches was one of the best decisions we have made. I believe that no child should be separated from their parents or live in containment because of the difficult decision to enter our country. And I believe it's about time that a woman of color is on a presidential ticket. I believe none of us are free until all of us are free. I have a seemingly simple but important question to ask of each staff member in District 287. Do you want to work at 287? I'm asking this because we are about to embark on a whole new level of anti-racist work in our school district. This is the biggest priority for this school year. We'll be doing deep work on diversity, equity, inclusion, implicit bias, and race. And it's going to be awkward, messy, uncomfortable, emotional, and difficult, and we just need to accept it. If you are on the fence, have tolerated or are indifferent to racial equity and anti-racist work, or think that this too shall pass, then 287 is not likely the right employer for you. If you want to engage in anti-racist work and are willing to interrogate your own beliefs and practices, have difficult but important conversations with your colleagues and recognize aspects of whiteness, like fragility and defensiveness within yourself and understand that the success of our students reflect the quality of our collective instruction, then you know for sure that 287 is the place for you to continue your journey. I have a small request. I have shared my beliefs and promises with all of you. If you are willing, I'd love to hear yours. We've created a flip grid a video sharing tool to collect the diverse perspectives of our 287 staff. This prompt is simple. What are your personal beliefs and promises about race, race equity, and anti-racist work? This link to submit your video is in the email you received earlier today. Colleagues, this week, all of us will be take, taking in a lot of new information as we prepare for the school year. I read a tweet this weekend that sum up, summed up the most important mindset that educators can have this year. And if there's only one thing that you remember from my speech, it is this. We cannot forget our purpose in the classroom and education. Content does not come before life and justice. It's a means for justice and should sustain life. Plan well, teach brilliantly, overcome our educational slavery that this country has engaged in. Think deeply, teach justly. To close my speech, I would like to share the words of Representative John Lewis, a civil rights activist and 33 year servant to our nation. And he wanted the world to hear this on the day of his funeral. John Lewis's last words appeared in the New York Times today in an essay that he wrote shortly before his death, intending it to be published on the day of his funeral. Here is that essay, 
read for us today by John Lewis's friend and admirer, Morgan Freeman. While my time here has now come to an end, I want you to know that in the last days and hours of my life, you inspired me. You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story when you used your power to make a difference in our society. Millions of people motivated simply by human compassion laid down the burdens of division. Around the country and the world, you set aside race, class, age, language, and nationality to demand respect for human dignity. That is why I had to visit Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, though I was admitted to the hospital the following day. I just had to see and feel it for myself that after many years of silent witness, the truth is still marching on. Emmett Till was my George Floyd. He was my Richard Brooks, Sandra Bland, and Breonna Taylor. He was 14 when he was killed, and I was only 15 years old at the time. I will never ever forget the moment when it became so clear that he could easily have been me. In those days, fear constrained us like an imaginary prison, and troubling thoughts of potential brutality committed for no understandable reason were the bars. Though I was surrounded by two loving parents, plenty of brothers, sisters, and cousins, their love could not protect me from the unholy oppression waiting just outside that family circle. Unchecked, unrestrained violence and government-sanctioned terror had the power to turn a simple stroll to the store for some Skittles or an innocent morning jog down a lonesome country road into a nightmare. If we are to survive as one unified nation, we must discover what so readily takes root in our hearts that could rob Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina of her brightest and best. Shoot unwitting concert goers in Las Vegas and choke to death the hopes and dreams of a gifted violinist like Elijah McLean. Like so many young people today, I was searching for a way out, or some might say a way in. And then I heard the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on an old radio. He was talking about the philosophy and discipline of nonviolence. He said, we are all complicit when we tolerate injustice. He said, it is enough to say it will get better by and by. He said, each of us has a moral obligation to stand up, speak up, and speak out. When you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. Democracy is not a state. It is an act. And each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community, a nation and world society at peace with itself. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Voting and participating in the democratic process are key. The vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. You must also study and learn the lessons of history because humanity has been involved in this soul-wrenching existential struggle for a very long time. People on every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. The truth does not change. And that is why the answers worked out long ago can help you find solutions to the challenges of our time. Continue to build union between movements stretching across the globe because we must put away our willingness to profit from the exploitation of others. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, 
Let them see that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last, and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. John Lewis gets tonight's last word through the voice of his friend, Morgan Freeman. What a powerful, inspiring last words. But I have to tell you, my favorite line came from Sandy's speech when she said, if our staff is healthy, cared for, and supported in the best way possible to do their jobs, I know the students will be cared for as well. Thank you. You know, what good trouble is for me, it's finding a way to get in the way. It's speaking up when I see injustice. It's having the courage, the courageous conversation and experiencing discomfort and at all times pain. It's recognizing that when I need racial affinity to process my own experiences because race equity work can be simultaneously energizing and exhausting. It's recognizing when I need white allies to work with their white peers to process their experiences as white people. I invite all of our staff to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble this school year. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to remind you that we will dedicate some time at the end of the uh, speech to address four questions and answers. So be sure to submit any questions you have for RESMA in the Google form that was provided to you by email earlier this morning. Now, I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Resma Minikin. Resma is a healer, author, and trauma specialist. His book, My Grandmother's Hands, is a New York Times and Washington Post bestseller. But this man is not about the accolades. He coaches leaders like us in 287 on how to do the embodied work to gain the cultural maturity to lead and build community within ourselves, our colleagues, our community, and movements. Our work with RESMA and Justice Leadership Solutions will set a course for how 287 leads in healing historical and racialized trauma carried in the body and the soul. Please join me. Let's welcome Resma. <laughs> hey, hey everybody. Is that, is that how we do it? We do it like this now? Okay. <laughs> it's good to see all your faces. Um, you know, uh, I've been sitting here for, uh, for the past um, 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, listening to Sandra, then listening to uh, the ancestor uh, speak to us. And, um, you know, this is the fourth the fourth one of these that I've been doing over the last couple of weeks, where, where school districts have asked me to come in and talk to them about how do we begin to kind of address the issues that have, you know, vexed our country since its inception, even before its inception. Remember, that you know america did not become american until 1776 um the issues that we're talking about actually existed way before that um the issues of 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 who is human and who is not the issues of who is a separate species and who it's acclimated to being part of the human family those questions have been sewn into every structure of america and so even before we began to um, um, try and, you know, take our our own um, kind of bite at the apple with regard to dealing with race, I think we have to begin to think about contextualizing what it is that we actually mean. 
that the things that we're experiencing right now are not just something that just popped up yesterday. They have a long storied history, a long storied um, mores and roots. Um, and so those things cannot just be wiped away with a cognitive change, a cognitive understanding. Um, there is something that we must do um, that involves the body. Um, as I like to say, embodied anti-racist practice, embodied anti-racist culture building, embodied anti-racist container building. We have to begin to create those types of things that don't currently exist. And so as I was listening to Sandy, one of the, one of the most profound, or, or Sandra, one of the most profound things that came up for me was one of the things that she said both at the beginning and at the end. At the beginning, one of the first things she did was acknowledge indigenous um, people. And many times when we, uh, I, I've, I've heard I've heard people do that a lot. They Now it's, it's almost become like a thing, a rote thing that people do, right? They, they, you know, I want to acknowledge Dakota people, Lakota people, I want to acknowledge this, I want to acknowledge that. And I think, that one of the things that can happen is that that can become performative too. And the thing I appreciate about what Sandra did is that when she said it, I actually, there was something that happened in my body that I experienced that the way that she was saying it, it I had a sense of authenticity to it, right? And that sense of it can't be something that we just act like doesn't we don't experience anything there's something that happens to us when we hear somebody talk and we watch their face and we track what's happening right we have an experience and many times that experience is not given any type of credence it's something that we just blow blow away or blow off and continue to like we got to get to the lesson plan we got to get to this and we got to get to that and what i'm saying is we have to slow down and experience and listen and work with the energy of that. And so I really appreciated not just what she said, but the energy and the vibration of the the energy and the vibration of authenticity that came uh, authenticity that came along with it. Our kids, many of the kids that you that y'all work with, have had to develop the ability to operate and deal with vibes deal with vibrations, deal with what's showing up that I can't articulate in a verbal, in, in, in necessarily in a verbal way, but I know I'm experiencing something and the energy of it is positioning me and pushing me in a certain way. Our kids have, have had to work with vibes, especially if our kids are housed in a black or brown or indigenous body. They've had to operate because their people's very survival has depended on understanding that as, as, a barom as using their bodies as barometers. And so you can say as a teacher, you can say certain things that you think are supportive, are understanding, are um, are the right thing to say, and the way that the way that your your the the bodies of culture, the kids' bodies of culture, the way that they pick up on it is the totally exact opposite of what you're trying to communicate, and that has to do with how do you be, how do we begin to develop a culture that can actually hold the concepts of race and resource and authenticity how do we create a, a container as a, as opposed to just saying that you know i'm an ally or just saying that i support you it that does not that does not tap into the to the requisite amount of resonance that many of our children depend on in order for their survival and so when Sandra said some of those pieces, I picked up something. The last thing she said is, do you want to work at 287? I think that is a very, as a leader, that is a very important thing. And a very, and, and it is in some of us, some of you may have picked that up and said, had kind of a, like a recoil response, like, wow, you know, 
I want to be a teacher, but that just kind of put me back on my heels. That is those those types of responses are important and necessary. The idea that a leader is saying, I want to be held accountable and I will hold you accountable in partnership. And that and that at 287, we're going for something bigger than we have ever gone for in the past years. But not not just because we have a new, not, not just because we speak our mission statement. Not just because we have uh, 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 got some new uh, some new understanding or some new uh, uh, curriculum. What she's saying, and what I hear Sandra saying, is that we are going to go into this direction because it is imperative for our future. We are going into this direction because two eighty seven actually has the capacity at this point to be a beacon and a light for how to do this work, right? And if you want to do that type of work and you want to be part of that, understand that it is not an easy path. Understand that when you watched my ancestor stand next to the, 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 the Pettus Edmund Bridge, when you watch that, that what you were watching was a man who was who had dedicated his life to racial equity, had dedicated his life to making change, and that bridge was still named Pettus Edmund. Think about that. All of the work and everything that he did, and that bridge was still named after somebody that that had that to our people was not a hero, okay? And so even with all of the work that he did, there were certain things that he had to hand off for the next generation. And so as part of this work for this year, how do we begin to seed the soil and seed the ground, not need to know the outcome at the end? How do we begin to do our work right now? So as we begin to move forward with our children, as we begin to move forward with um, with this uh, with this new idea, but not this new idea, with this idea of that we at 287 can actually change the world. How do we begin to put those seeds in place? And one of the things that I want to say about that is that we have to understand that the work is 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 not um is not about a a short get it is about how do we slowly do the things that will allow us to transform how do we slowly begin to do the things and do the work both individually and communally that will allow us to be able to hold the actual transformation that we say we want to have that does not happen in a year. It does not happen in two years. Many of the many of the organizations that I'm working with across the country, I've I've been saying it takes nine generations. It will take nine generations for for uh for us to begin to get to the heart of the of 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 of, of race. It will take nine generations for white folks to even be able to know what the race thing is because the very structure is predicated on the white body being the standard of humanity. I want to say that one more time. And I want you, as I say that, I want you just to track what happens for you when I say that. That we live in a society and we live in a structure and in a world where the white body is the supreme standard by which all bodies humanity shall be measured structurally the race question in this in this country and in this world is really not a race question it is a species question is radius primate is resma a monkey is resma a different species that question 
has been woven through every institution of America? And the answer to that question is resume and radius are not structurally human based on pigmentation. Now, that is a, now to hear me say that, your body is doing something as you hear me say that. Something is happening to you right now as you hear me say that. There is a push back on that. There is a collapsing on that. There is a wanting to run on that. There is all. There are pieces that are happening to you. And what we have to begin to do as a 287 community is be able to slow that down because that energy actually fuels what we do. That energy actually fuels what we say. Unexamined. And 287 this year has to be about examining that energy. 287 this year has to, there is so, you have such an opportunity here to actually create the standard by which education will be done for our children. But you're not going to get there without slowing this down and examining these pieces. Typically what, what organizations do, what they have done in the past is they, when they begin to embark on dealing with race, they begin to say, let's just have some conversations. Let's get in the room and let's start talking about race, right? And what ends up happening is that the bodies of culture begin to roll their eyes and go, I do not want to do this again. I don't want to have this experience again. And the experience that bodies of culture have when they, when they get involved with diversity and equity um, conversations is the experience of what I call filleting. And what I mean by that is that they are filleted open in terms of their narrative, in terms of their story, and they leave feeling opened. And the white bodies end up leaving feeling and experiencing a sense of, okay, I, yeah, I got something from that, or there, you know, there was a, um, I got some education or something, you know, but no place to hold that education. And so everybody ends up leaving that interaction feeling bad and worse. And it's because no container has been built to hold the charge of race. The idea of race actually has a charge to it. It has a weight to it. It has a texture to it. It has a speed to it. And so when we go and just open it up with no preparation, with no container building, with nothing to contain the, 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 the possible cooking that can occur, people break apart and they never want to have that experience again. That brings me to the place of when we're talking about race, we are in, in, inherently talking about not just being trauma informed. That's been buzz for the last couple of years. How do we become trauma informed? How do we become not just, and now not, not how do we become trauma informed, but how do we become racially trauma informed, right? How do we get the education so we can be informed about how race is actually a tra can actually be traumatic? How race, how the idea of race in and of itself can actually keep people stuck. And what I would say to you is that what I heard Sandra say is that that is not enough. It is not enough to be trauma informed this year. We're going to have to work on how do we become trauma responsive? How do we become trauma responsive and not waiting for something to happen, but actually understand that these things like, sis like sister Brianna, things like Emmett Till, things like Philando Castillo, things like Brother George Floyd are not episodic. 
They're structural. Not waiting for a quote unquote racist incident, but understand that racism and white body supremacy is woven into the structure. So there's actually an opportunity to address it as opposed to addressing it as an episode. The stuff is not episodic, it is structural, it is philosophical, and it requires us to develop a different discipline. And in developing that different discipline, that means you're going to get uncomfortable. In developing that different discipline, it means that we're going to have to begin to look at those things. And that's why that's why uh, Sandra's saying, do you want to work at 287 is so important. And if you don't, there's no harm, no foul. But what I heard Sandra saying is that this is the direction that we're going in. This is what we're going to be doing. It's going to be messy and painful. We're going to be building a, a plane while we're flying it. And we're going to make mistakes. And if that's the case, and if we're going to do that, I need to know if you can handle that. And you may not be able to handle that. And that's fine. The commitment to the work that we're going to be doing is not just for us. It is about laying the seeds and thinking, and not just thinking, as she said, not just thinking outside of the box, but thinking that there may need to be a new box. How do we, how do we take the curriculum? How can 287 take a, a curriculum and have it be responsive to the population that, we, that you serve? Are there ways to do it that 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 we know all of the holes of the curriculum as it has existed we know the holes we know the holes in terms of how how indigenous children do not see themselves in the curriculum and it ain't enough just to put images in the room what is the narrative that can that can stir in the belly in, in an embodied sense of those children. What are the narratives? What are the understanding? What are the embodied narratives that can be used to draw out the resource in indigenous children as opposed to waiting for a certain time to do it? How do we begin to, to, to have this curriculum both, both in a hybrid sense, in a in a um in a in a totally virtual sense, how can we begin to say, if we were going to create a, a curriculum from the ground up that would actually lean into the pieces that we know to be holes that have always been holes in public education, how would we do that? In an embodied sense, in an embodied way, how would we, how would we weave in anti-racist practices, understanding, and culture building into the curriculum of math, into the curriculum of history, into the curriculum of English, whatever it is, uh, uh, computer design, how would we do that in embodied sense? That is, the, that is the opportunity that I think 287 has at this point. Our kids are coming back to see their teachers and walk in the halls before COVID hit, before COVID-19 hit. In my community, in the Black community, before COVID-19, we had COVID-16-19. The weathering effects of, 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 of the brutality, the historical brutality, the intergenerational brutality, the persistent institutional brutality, and then our own personal brutality have weathered the bodies of Black people for 400 years have weathered the 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 bodies of indigenous people for four, five and six hundred years you can't separate the children that come into your classroom from the fact that black women die more often in childbirth than other women that infant mortality in, in black women, regardless of socioeconomic status, is higher than what it is 
for other women. And you can't just account that for lifestyle. If you don't account for the 400 years of rape, brutality, um, um, and carnage on Black women's bodies, you won't be able to account for what has been passed down in terms of the weathering effects of that unrepaired high blood pressure in my community um, can't just be accounted for in lifestyle choices. Something happened and continues to happen to my people. 287 has the ability to address some of that now, as opposed to it being an episode where somebody gets murdered. We say it's structural, so how do we begin to deal with it as a structural phenomenon, as opposed to an episodic phenomenon? This is the work of 287 for this year. And it's going to be messy. And I would ask that we, we, we're gentle with ourselves. I would ask that we spend time um, um, really kind of excavating what are those pieces that are showing up for me? Not spend time trying to ask Radius a billion questions. Not spend time trying to blow all of that through her. And one of the things I say about Radius, I, I love Radius, but one of the things, one of the things, Radius don't know how to say no. <laughs> she say yes to every damn thing, right? And and it's one of the things I've said to her for a long time. You gonna get you, you go you, one of these days. You are gonna learn, <laughs> right? You gotta let people work through their stuff. You can't always educate the hell out of them. You gonna educate them to death, right? That ain't gonna work. People need to work with this stuff, right? And so this year, it is my hope. It is truly my hope that y'all start to begin to work with it and create a container so this work can happen and, and, and happen in an embodied way, not just in, in, a, in, in an intellectual way. This is not being the most white work person at 287. That's not going to work. We're talking about building a culture not a culture that just that is just predicated on this year's strategic plan an embodied culture because that's what this stuff is the brutality that happened to my people did not just happen to us individually it happened to us communally the brutality that happened to to to, to white folks going to lynchings and 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 going silent that brutality, that the the brutality that happened to white folks, realize most white people that are here come from descendants who flow, who who were fleeing something. Think about that. Most white people that are here came are descendants from people who were fleeing something. That has never been addressed. That piece got, got co-opted by whiteness. Those things have to be dealt with. That shows up. Your niceness is inadequate. So it is my hope that in this year, we get a chance to actually start to begin to work with this stuff, start to think and dream about what would it look like for 287 to be the beacon of the United States about how to do this work. This is going to involve uh, sweat. This is going to involve capital. This is going to involve equity. And this is going to involve your body. And so in closing, when Sasha said, do you want to work at 287? That is not a throwaway. And, and you will be answering that question throughout the whole year. That is not a throwaway um, statement. That is a very important statement. What she's saying is, I want you to evaluate this every day. <laughs> every day. This is not a question where I want you to, she's saying, I want you to raise your hand. 
yeah, I can't do this. I'm not, I'm tapping out, Sandra. I'm going home, right? That's not what she's saying. She said, every day, I want you to ask that question. Do I want to work here? And am I willing to go through this? And that is an everyday question. And if the answer is yes for that day, beautiful. Let's get to work. Just want to say thank you for allowing me to spend this time with you. And um, Radius, if got if people got questions, I'm willing to to listen. All right. Woo! Thank you, Restaurant. Thank you, thank you, colleague. Two eighty seven. We're nearing the end of today's program, and quite a few of you have submitted questions. Uh, so be sure to submit your exit ticket once we close the virtual event. You can find it in the email that was sent to you earlier today. So let's answer some questions. And so I guess because there are so many questions, <laughs> I really need to know how many questions you want to respond to that will help uh, me. Let's let's start. Let's 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 um. You know I can run my mouth, so let's let's start with three and then see where we go. See where we go there. Right, so. So the first question that I want to share with you says, how can I, as a classroom teacher, teach my students the proud history of their ancestors' culture without creating trauma? Mm, that's a beautiful question. So everything for me starts with culture building and cultural container building. That question is actually not an individual classroom question. That question is actually a culture question, the district, and a culture question of the particular schools, right? That 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 is a question that teaching teaching people about their history is different than allowing their history to emerge in front of you. You know what I mean when I say that? That 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 this this quality of of teaching that I'm talking about is an emergent teaching, not a putting in teaching, right? And so these pieces around how do I do it in my classroom first have to start with how do I do it with myself? How do I do it with the other white bodies? Because you know, 90% of the teachers in your district are white. So how do you begin to have that discussion? How do we do it as teachers with each other first? And then when you create that container and do that work, that can possibly create more room for your for your students to be able to you. So if you have resource, more resource, both community and individually, your your students will tap into that because they went to the room of it. But if you're just going into it as a cognitive curriculum, how do I teach this, you know, so I don't traumatize my kids? Well, you're going, you're, you're missing the piece. You have to do this piece first and allow it to emerge up out, right? Because in the emergence, in your own emergence, you will learn things about yourself that you, that, that just teaching the curriculum will not allow you to access. So that's that's how I would answer. And I know some of the some of the answers to my question to, to these questions will be totally unsatisfying to people because people want a well tell me what to do. Resma, just tell me what to do and I'll do it, right? And I don't do I'm I don't do that because I don't believe I believe that what has to happen has to be emergent and you have to get in your reps in order for the fit for, for for the kind of um the kind of resonance that you want to have with their students, you have to actually do reps. You got to get in reps. You got to make mistakes. You gotta, you gotta get bears. You and then you gotta come back again and get and, and get another. That's that in that process, something emerges. You go through that process, you're a whole different, you won't ask me that question because you're a whole different person on the on the other side of it. So Resma, some of our 287 staff will do a deeper dive with this work and you right. through a program called the um, Year of Learning. Right. Can you talk with the staff about the Year of Learning program and what that might look like for yeah. them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give them a better idea of 
trying to decide whether or not they actually would like to submit an application, yeah. you know, be a part of that year of learning with you. What is that going to look like? What will it entail? Sure. So the year of learning first starts off with a, um, with a, uh, a, a, uh, uh, either a two, four hour, uh, uh, two, 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 four hour days with people working with me, um, or a full eight hour session. Um, and what that does is, is set the foundation for the language, for the container, that type of stuff. Then throughout the year, we begin to, we read the book or you guys will read the book together and then we'll begin to explore things in different. Yeah. My grandmother's hands, you'll begin to explore things with each other. So, so white bodied. Um, and I talk about bodies because this whole structure was based on bodies. Remember I talked about the race question is the species question. That species question was predicated on the body. What does that body look like? And, and you can determine based on whether or not the body was, was white or black, right? Um, and then everything was a deviant in between, right? And all the way down to the black body, which was deemed to be not human, right? That ethos was woven into, right? And so I have white bodies begin to work with white bodies in what I call triads, right? And so you get a chance to pack, practice the embodiment pieces as we're working through it. I have bodies of culture also do that because one of the things that happens with bodies of culture is that what you'll start to see in bodies of culture is also horizontal stuff that shows up between cultures, right? And so I don't want, I don't, the reason why I don't slam groups together like that is because there's too many too much charge with that and so many things that i can't catch right and i want bodies to work with those things so the wounding and rewounding doesn't have to occur right so we do that for a year we get a lot of practice in a lot of talking in a lot of what i call soul scribing and i'll talk to you guys about the process of soul scribing um and then also um uh, doing a lot of the triad work through the course of the year, at the end of the year, the same people you start with are not the same people you end with, right? A lot of people have a lot of fervor, and you know this, Radius, have a lot of fervor at the beginning of it, right? But then, but then a murder happens, right? Then a, a shooting happens, right? And then all of a sudden, those people that were there at a, at, at a somewhat calm place, right? That were there start to drop off. I always say the people that the people, the people in terms of in the, my idea about this is what I call somatic abolitionism. I believe that we have to somatically abolish white body supremacy through the body first and set the container. And so through the course of, the, of working with 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 with, with the, the 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 kind of ethos of somatic abolitionism. People think that the people that you start with are the people that these are your people, and they are not. The, your people are the people that end with you, <laughs> right? Your people are the people that you get reps in with, right? Some of the people that start will not be the people that end. You will you will start with a hundred people. You may start with a hundred people, and by the end of it, you 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 end with thirty. Right. And some people see that as well, that's 30 people. That is not enough. Listen, that's more than enough, because now you have people who are committed and they're building containers. So then when you do other trainings with other people, it's not just Resma coming in to do it. You actually have a container of people that can actually do the work throughout the organization. Right. Um, what happens a lot of times is that people come in and they bring in somebody like a resume or somebody and they do the work. And then the moment stuff gets hot and the pressure starts, people crack and pull apart because they haven't developed a container for the cooking to occur in. Does that make sense? So the so year of learning really is about uh, the first year is really about creating a container. Right. So you have people that can go into that next year and actually be a, uh, uh, be a partner in the work as opposed to just coming in and doing training. And, and, and let me say this in organizational in organizational work. This is the process that I believe works better than what I used to do before. And that was coming in, doing some work with people and doing this. This actually works better and is less brutal on bodies of culture, right? It's less brutal because it's not just one 
one person or a group of people that are the the quote unquote diversity people right it is it it, it has to be both a vertical and horizontal cross section of people uh in that first year right that the, from from everybody from from the custodian all the way up to the superintendent that is involved that is involved in that process so yeah thank you so much because we talked about the depth and breadth across the organization should be yeah. involved in the change process yeah Time one more question because yeah. that was two. So That's the it. last question is in our very divided world that seems to condone and legitimize overt racism, I find myself seeking new ways not only to balance the pain that brings but um, actively try to develop the language to use to speak out. Yes. They're barraged with information and opinions. Yeah. What one specific thing that you could wish schools and staff would do from your perspective to bring humanity forward? Um, um, we live in a structure there. The, we all have a tremendous amount of both uh, a, a tremendous amount of individual resource. We have not cultivated communal resource. Right. And, and white people in particular have not cultivated communal resource as it relates to being anti racism and anti racist practices. Right. You know, so, so I've, I've had, I've, I've been doing this for a while. I've had white people come up to me and say, I, this is, I didn't know that this was happening. And I, my eyes are opened up now. And a level that sounds very like, um, that sounds like, you know, that, that sounds like a very nice thing to say, right? But those types of things are very wounding, right? Because what it suggests is that 400 years of my brutality, 400 years, 500 years has gone past you. You have, you, and so when you say now that you see it, when black brown and indigenous people have been saying it for hundreds of years it's wounding and so there is not one thing that i can say to do i'm saying start with uh what we're trying to do now is create a container so all of the charge of that right we the the, the idea of bringing humanity back is 400 500 600 year behind the eight ball on this right so if we think we're going to bring it back simply by changing our cognitive um stance that's not going to work we've got to create it right so what i would say is we have to create a container first um are there rules are there rules of decorum are there rules around you know just basic rules around. Yeah, there are some rules, right? You don't you don't want to you don't want to cuss nobody out. You don't want to write all that different type of stuff, right? But 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 that's not anti-racist practices. That's not anti-racist culture building, right? Embodied anti living embodied anti-racist practices and culture building. That's what I'm talking about. That's somatic abolitionism. And so for me, that question really is. A, a, a it, it it's um it's a it's it's one of those kind of quick questions like tell me one thing that we can do to do this well if i if if that was going to be the cure of element i would keep saying <laughs> you know here's the one thing you can do if that's really was the curative piece for that that's not the curative piece the curative because even if i say it you don't have a you don't have a a, a, a communal culture that can hold whatever it is that i'm saying so let's be about developing the the community, the, the the container first. That's what I would say. Once again, thank you, Resma. You're thank very you. welcome. I'll talk to y'all later. Bye. 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 To everyone, I hope you have an awesome, awesome week. Reconnecting with your colleagues and learning everything our minds can consume this week as we prepare for our students.
Enjoy your lunch from wherever you are. And we'll see you back in workshop sessions this afternoon at noon. So to everyone, please, I have enjoyed being your MC. I look forward to collaborating and partnering with you on this very, very important work. Please submit, watch for the applications to be a part of the Year of Learning with Redma. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everyone.